for you. So thanks for the organizer for having me here. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is going to be the first part is all going to be about uh, ideas from spectral theory, but mostly to learn functions, and in the second part a bit of a look to more geometric ideas. It's going to be part you know, something old and something new. A bit of it is just reviews of work done in the past that we will start to work again on recently. And the core of the idea is a line of work that uh, we did a while ago with, uh, oops, with Ernesto De Vito and uh, Andrea Caponetto from Italy. And around the same time, um, Steve Mail and Ding Xuan Zhou, you know, worked on related idea. I guess Yuan, who is here, was also partially involved in this kind of ideas. We developed a bunch of tools and concepts that we used in several ways. And so today I would like to give you a, a highlight of how this idea, uh, the, main, the main tools in here and possible application. Uh, just to set the stage of the kind of stuff I have in mind, um, the kind of problem I have in mind, I think the prototype problem is signal classification. So the goal here is you have high dimensional input vectors and you want to say classify them in two classes. This is a simple example where you have, uh, we have a faces and not faces, this is the matrix. So, the key point is here that in current application, N is big and P is big. And I don't know which one is bigger. Here I put millions in there, but it's big and big, okay? That's kind of the situation where we're dealing with right now. I have in mind application like the one Vikash was talking about on Wednesday. So you can view this as a high dimensional statistical problem. Uh, just one observation that to me was important is A, the goal here is really generalization, so to predict new data. And perhaps with respect to other line of research, the, the measurements here are not generic in the sense they are not just random uh, Gaussian numbers, okay? They're extremely related to each other and in a very nonlinear way. And that's one very important point. Another important point that the relation between the input and the output is also typically highly nonlinear, okay? So these are kind of the rule of the game. So some of the ideas, say, related to compressed sensing don't fit immediately in this kind of framework, essentially because of these two requirements. Uh, in this context, uh, I think, you know, to me the two main challenges are on the one hand try to see how you can parameterize function in a good way or equivalent to represent the data. And I'm not going to talk about that, but that's part of the whole deep learning craze is part of that is because they provide pretty good features. What I'm going to talk about is the, another aspect, which is this idea of how to do inference or statistical model which is computationally efficient, okay? And what I'm going to point at today goes more in that direction. Uh, so I'm going to start giving you a short review of some of kind of classical concepts that you have inverse problems. And, uh, and th these are actually really classical, so I'm just going to try to be, go a bit quickly over them, assuming that at least to some form they are familiar to some of you. And then I'm going to just try to apply them, okay? And what we see is that when you apply them, you get something, some things that we already know and something that we already know and kind of a unified view. And so I'm going to apply this to learning function and then see some other applications, okay? So uh, what's an inverse problem? Well, it's, it's basically defined by this kind of linear equations. Matrix operator doesn't really matter for now. The key point is that A is known, and let's say for a second that G is known, and what you have to find is F, okay? So here is the picture, here is the, uh, a solution space, a data space, and what might happen is, uh, is a bunch of bad things. One is that the G might not belong to the range of A, so that there is no F that can be mapped into G. Or A might actually map more than one thing in the same place, so it's not injective. So even if there is one, there might be more than one solution. But perhaps the, the worst thing is that you don't really have G in most application. And the classical model is you have uh, a vector G delta, which is a far away uh, at most delta from the kind of data you like to retrieve. And what might happen is that uh, what you want to prove the behavior of the solution, which is somewhat stable with respect to delta, okay? If you change delta a little bit, you will like, get something which is not completely different. And this is related to the behavior of, if you want, the inverse, which might not be bounded, or even if it's bounded to the product of these two quantities, the smallest and bigger, the condition number, okay? So th this is like the classical perspective. So. How do people think about these kind of problems? Well, <coughs> the first thing is, uh, uh, in some sense, if the G doesn't belong to the range, you have no clue. You, you have, it's hopeless to find the solution. So what you do is that basically you say, I'm going to take this G, I'm going to project it on the range, and then I'm going to find the solution on the other side. There might be more than one. I take the one with minimum norm. 
okay? And that's what is called the Moore Perot solution or generalized solution. So the first thing you do is, if there exists no solution, I define one possible solution that is going to be my target of the problem, okay? But the next step is that now if you plug here, you see I put G, the, the true uh, data. If you now plug the, the, the actual noisy data, this guy might not have uh, a stable behavior with respect to the noise, and the, the noisy data. Okay, so what you do is that the classical thing is do, say, Tikhonov regularization. Okay, so you now replace this with the penalized minimization, which is now a family of possible solutions indexed over lambda, and you have to choose this lambda depending on the noise in such a way that this problem gives you a reasonable solution to the original problem. Okay, I'm assuming that everybody is, uh, is uh, familiar with this. Okay, so, and this is just my starting point, okay? So, if you look at the literature in recent years, there has been, a, this has been like the starting point of a ginormous amount of extensions, and uh, a lot of extensions were related to A, replacing this cost function with more general cost functions, perhaps coming from some kind of probabilistic interpretation in terms of likelihood, or generalizing these norms to a variety of different norms, okay? But the starting point has always been this kind of penalization function. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to describe you next is a kind of a spectral perspective on this kind of algorithm, which somewhat suggests the other way to think about algorithms, or if you want, estimators, when you do statistics, which is not penalization, but it's something else, okay? And it's going to be first in a simplified setting, the linear setting, and then giving pointers to how you can extend this idea. So, and, and the key point here, so I'm sorry, my slides are all uh, crumbly with stuff because we just turned into a PDF, so instead of appearing pieces by pieces, you just see everything. So there's no suspense here, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna cover with my body, I guess. So the key point in giving the spectral perspective on this kind of algorithm is write down the uh, singular value decomposition of the operator A, okay? So we assume that operator A is compact, or just assume the, that it's finite dimensional, take the SVD, okay? And this is the SVD decomposition. Then, as soon as you write this SVD decomposition, you can write down what is the minimal norm solution, and it's just this, okay? And what you see is that the instability really comes from the presence of this one over sigma j. You divide, I'm just writing down the projection of g over this SVD of the operator A, and this is your problem, okay? And this operator here is what is called the, the pseudo inverse. So now Tikhonov simply replaced this one over sigma j with this quantity, okay? And this quantity here is just tells you. If, in some sense, if, uh, if lambda is much bigger than sigma j, this is overcome and this is going to dominate. If sig lambda is very small, essentially you get the same thing you get here, okay? So this is the same thing as before, just a spectral perspective on it. And the way you want to think about this is as a filter, okay? You view this as component of a function, something like Fourier components on this, on this basis, ordered with respect to the eigenvalue. So the first few components are the big uh, eigenvalues and the first few components are small eigenvalues. And what this is doing is that it's a low-pass filter. Unstable components related to small eigenvalues will be dumped out, and the ones which are big enough are going to actually be preserved, okay? So the, the idea of uh, spectral filtering regularization is basically saying, how about we replace this with another filter function, okay? So what I did in this equation is just that I replaced one over sigma j plus lambda with another filter function, okay, that I call f lambda. The way you should think about this filter function is some function that behaves roughly like this one, okay? And the question is, are there other examples of filter functions that are interesting? What do they correspond to? What kind of computation they have? What kind of algorithm with what kind of guarantees you can derive, okay? <clears throat> Notice that once you define a filter function, at least in principle, immediately you have some kind of operator, okay, you, like a regularization operator. You know already what this is for Tikhonov, okay? Um, there is an A star missing here, okay? That's exactly what you have. And here you have some others, okay? And the one, I, anticipating things a bit, one main point here is that I'll define different filter functions, and not all of them will need to, you know, will require SVD to be computed. And so this would be like one highlight of these kind of methods. So, What's a good filter function? So this is going to be the kind of algorithms I want to introduce. These are linear in the sense that they act linearly on the G delta. Okay, they're just matrices acting on this guy. And so the typical idea is again, I, I can uh, here I am a bit informal, but you can formalize exactly the axioms that gives you what kind of filters are admissible to define good uh, uh, linear regularization. And here I just give you a feeling. So when lambda is small, it should get you back one over sigma. 
Okay, think of Tikhonov. Okay, just take these two properties and make them into axioms. And if you look at the soup of this function, you can view this essentially as the soup norm, the operator norm of the filter function, and you would basically like this to be controlled by lambda, exactly what happened to Tikhonov. Okay, if lambda is small or big, this controls the condition number of this quantity here. Okay, that make sense. So, three examples. Tikhonov, okay. This is what is called TSVD, okay. Simply, what you do is that you keep one over sigma. If sigma is bigger than lambda, otherwise you throw it away. Another way to say this is just enumerate the singular values and keep the first m, okay. And the other way you just throw away. The last one is this guy here, okay. I don't know if you've seen it before. Again, it's something it is completely obvious if you've seen it. But two observation. What is this? Well, think about it as a truncated series expansion. Okay, so take sigma to the minus one, write it as a power expansion. Okay, this would be an equality, and now you just truncate. Okay, so this parameter t here, I should have put it here. The t is really lambda here. Okay, so the number of the only f there are two free parameters. There is a gamma here, and there is a t here. In gamma you should just choose as a constant so that this series converge if you let t goes to infinity. Okay? So think of gamma as a constant that depends on sigma. The free parameter is only this guy. And the more t, the more you get close to, the, the higher is t, the more you get close to 1 over sigma. Okay? So each of these immediately define an algorithm. Okay? And if you stop here, basically the game would be take your matrix, do the SVD, plug this guy inside, and check if these filters are any one, you know, one is better than the other. But computationally, you would have to do SVD every, in every case. Okay? And this is not too appealing. <coughs> for example, for Tikhonov, we know that we have a bunch of different kind of techniques to do it. Okay? So one question is, is there another way to implement these kind of filters if some of them can be done without actually advocating an SVD? And this is well known to be possible. So the one I want to show you is this one here. So again, now I wrote it. So this is just, think of lambda as 1 over t. Okay? That's exactly the kind of uh, uh, association you need to do. So the key point here is that just look at this iteration. Okay? If you run it for t times, at step t, you get exactly the solution you would get if you were to compute the SVD and plug in this expression. That make sense? So suppose that you plug here this expression, and then you build this operator, then you get the function, okay? Instead of doing this way, what I'm telling you is that you can prove, and it's a one-line induction proof, that if you run this, these steps, you get the same thing, okay? So this, in some sense, is the, this is the cute aspect of this story, that to compute some of this, and in particular these iterative regularization techniques, you don't need to. In some sense, do the SVD, but you can run an iteration, okay? And in a couple of slides, I'm going to show the complexity, and clearly this one will be much, much, much better, okay? And you can say, oh, this is simple, but this idea can be generalized in a bunch of ways. So, you know, I'm emphasizing this a bit because if you look, for example, in inverse problems, this is the algorithm of choice in the most large scale application. Nobody would end up doing, you know, a Tikhon of regularization. You would actually essentially apply conjugate gradient and then realize that conjugate gradient or anything like that is enough and you don't have to regularize in any other way. You can just stop the number of iterations. Okay? <clears throat> so two more comments. Again, this is an iteration that you stop. Okay? And T is the precision of your approximation. Gamma here, the step size, just comes from the idea that you need to have this series converging. So it's a constant and this is the number you have to pick. You need to know the spectral radius of your, of your problem. And of course, you can just view this as gradient descent. This is just the gradient of the risk, unregularized. So there is no explicit penalization to the problem. Okay. And I think, uh, uh, if you want, uh, I think uh, uh, Lorenzo and Mike, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, talk about implicit regularization. To me, you know, if there were, I don't know what implicit regularization really means. I just did some example. I think this is one good example. Okay, it's a good example of one case where I can actually view it in two different ways. This is essentially equivalent to Tikhonov, but it actually lives a life of its own right. Okay, and in some sense, the key point here is that computations and regularization coincide. Just one example. This is not yet learning, but just you know, simple interpolation problem, the noising problem. We have a bunch of points fixed and some noise. 
you just, what is the idea here? Here, this gives you a justification in terms of uh, matrix inversion, but you can also just use now this algorithm, and you can just say, I start fitting, I start from zero, and if I fit too much, I start to follow the noise, but ideally, if I stop before, I will get something which gets rid of the noise, okay? So now that you have this perspective, you could also pursue this perspective further, and this would be the way to go beyond the least squares, essentially. Okay, so this little, uh, hopefully not too boring, uh, uh, review of some idea of an inverse problem was meant to essentially give you a feeling that there are principles other than penalization, that you can define them rigorously, and will be in some sense all different phases of the same idea, which is this idea of doing filtering on the spectrum. <clears throat> and the kind of nice idea is this observation that not only there are different principles, so essentially projections, iteration, and penalization are different phases of the same idea, but they have different computational properties. Note in pass is that if you look at the literature inverse problem, there are a bunch of extensions of the, of the setting I showed you, okay? For example, the noise can be taken to be stochastic, the operator itself can be taken to be noisy, <coughs> you can generalize to non-compact operators, and so on and so forth. And of course, also in that case, people generalize to different costs and different norms, okay? But I want to stick to uh, this kind of L2 norm uh, regularization, and I'll comment on that in a little bit. So um, if you go back to the original regularized view, uh, typically you will put like a weight in front of your regularizer. How is that coming into play here? Oh, it, each of these algorithms as it's, so you, you talk about uh, b b b the, the regularization parameter, this guy. The lambda there. Each of these algorithms has its own, okay? So each of these filter has a parameter lambda that exactly like, so that that in some sense so you can view it in two ways. It, it, that controls the fitting, the smoothing trade-off. So in Tikono, it's just this guy, the usual. Yeah. In SVD, it's just the cutoff. Yes. The important thing is that in this case, is the number of components you take. But you also have a gamma, right? The gamma is a constant, is a okay. number. It's a number that I choose to be one over a square. And then now the question you can ask me is, could I actually run this infinitely many times and pick this to be a regression parameter? Yes, but in some sense, Right now, I'd rather do the other thing, because if I fix this, then I can do much later. The cool thing here is that if I fix this, then now I can do fewer iteration, because I will do just enough computation to discover what's the signal in the data. But that's an important point, that the, 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 the revision parameter here is the number of iteration. I have a, there's yeah. some intuition that this is related to like a Fourier transform of your data or something, and you're keeping certain frequencies, you yeah. prefer the low, but not, and, but not too much or something. Exactly. Way. So there are, there are special, so in this case, you essentially use the singular value decomposition of the operator as if it was a, a Fourier series. Okay. And then you can think about it exactly in this case. So if this is just, a, say, a diffusion operator over some domain with some boundary recognition, you do get Fourier series, and that's exactly what you're doing. And I'm just telling you, to implement a low-pass filter, run an iteration. And this is where you keep all the frequencies with the same, same weight? Yeah, so I, I order the frequency to, from higher to lower, so the, uh -huh. I decom and then I just keep... The, the first is truncate the... It's just a loop series. Okay. Yeah, it's just a loop as filtering view on this. Is this truncated kind of in a really carbon's truncated power method in some sense? Uh, you got is, it. That, is that a way to get regularization that corresponds to truncating constant gradient, which is what people actually uh, let me comment on that in a little bit. So the short answer is essentially, so you can do two things, okay? Because clearly this, this can say, this, this, notice two things. So you can say, oh, this is low, okay? I don't want to do this. But then you can also ask, okay, but I don't want to converge anyway. So is this going to be important? Yes, it's going to be important. You can speed it up in two different ways. One is to do conjugate gradient. And this is going to become almost this, but it's not a linear method anymore. Or you can do some kind of acceleration which is more or less we have the nested of kind of stuff, and you still get the linear method, so you can still study in this framework. And then at the point, essentially, uh, I'll show you exactly what happened. So essentially, the square root of the number of iterations stuff is to, to get where you need to go. So you can do that. Just a detail, I was expecting uh, gamma to be, say, two time, one over two times the normal of A as opposed to the normal of A squared? Well, just this guy, this guy here, if you look, acts on A star A. So this is the singular values, and this is the eigenvalue. So, so yeah. the singular value is square root of uh, sigma, but here you have to put square root times square root. So it's just, uh, it's just what it, it does. So sigma is the eigenvalue of this. So if you want, I could put here uh, yeah, norm of A star A. 
Okay. Okay. So, learning. Okay. There is a, learning is in the in the in the background. So I'm gonna just consider this standard setting. So it's a regression, you know, non-parametric uh, random design regression setting. So I have x and y. I have the regression function, and for the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna assume that my output are bounded. Okay. I could relax to say Gaussian assumption and so on, but I don't want to do it. And uh, and under this assumption, I'm, let me introduce immediately this norm. I'm a bit sloppy. Rho is actually the norm on the space X, and this is just a norm, a natural norm associated to this probability distribution. It puts weights on points that are more likely to be sample. Okay? And the regression function is easy to see that it belongs there. This is all fixed but unknown. Oh no, you have your data, and now given the data, you want to find an approximation of this. Okay, now the question is is there an inverse problem here? So you can say, conceptually, something like this is happening. There is a model, then there is some sampling, then I want to go back. But I want an operator, and I want to be able you know, to touch these objects so that I can just plug in in the previous expressions. Okay? And this is going to cost me a bit of sweat. <coughs> so bear with me for a few slides. It's easy if you take a linear model. Just consider a linear model. Forget about this k for a second. Just consider a linear model. Okay? And just take the data, the finite dimensional case. That, then it's very easy to write down an inverse problem. You basically say, I'm going to assume that my function can be written as, or I'm going to try to find the linear function that fits my data, and I write down these linear equations. Okay? I might find a good W, I might not find it, but I can just write this linear system. And if I write it in matrix notation, so if I pile up all my Y and all the vectors of X into a matrix, this is just an N by D matrix, the data matrix. I apply to W and it gives me Y. Okay? So this is a map that goes from RD to RN. So this is OK. You can just do this. And you could start to apply things over there. But if you want to do theory, you have to ask yourself, this, is, this corresponds to the noisy situation. Okay? These data are sampled and noisy. The ideal problem is where you have no samples and no noise. So can we write down a similar equation that would correspond to the ideal case? What is it? Okay? Anything which is up here should have no sampling and no noise. And uh, one, one, bit, this is going to be a bit formal. If you look at Rn as the function L2 with respect to the empirical measure, you can recognize one to the other. So if you took the empirical measure, this is an atomic measure, and function are just uh, vectors. You know, the, the function value are just, you can see, as a component of a vector. Okay? So <coughs> at that point, you can actually replace the empirical measure with a true measure and just rebuild everything. And in some sense, instead of i from 1 over n, you get that this has to be true for any x in your support that you might sample. And instead of y, you actually get f rho, which is the average, OK? It's the, somewhat the, the, the noiseless version of y. <coughs> and the operator is a bit funny. So how do you read this equation? You're saying, I have a regression function, and I'm looking for a linear function which best approximates my regression function for any possible points that I can pick up from my distribution, OK? <coughs> and you can immediately introduce an associated operator, which is just acting on the function producing this. Okay? So now you can view this as an ideal setting and this as a noisy setting. Okay? You can apply the algorithm here and then try to show that theoretically you can go back here. Okay? But the, what I want to do is go beyond linear models. Okay? And I'm going to use kernels essentially because they provide me a general way. They might be important in practice or not depending on the kind of kernels you use. <coughs> Let me remind you that the, the key point in my talk is going to be that I'm going to look at, instead of just linear function, as a Hilbert space of functions. It has these two properties. There is a special function, k of xx, such that if I fix one of the two entries, this function is in the space. And this helped me to write down f of x through this inner product. Okay? This is all I need. And you can view this as a generalization of writing things in a linear, as a linear uh, function, where this is the weights and this is x. Okay? This is an abstract way to look at the same equation. And just two examples, if you take any dictionary of any size, okay, no assumptions, this is going to be a kernel. You can view this as whenever you're taking your data and you map them, you get a kernel. Okay? It's there. Whether you use it or not, it's there. <clears throat> or you can have stuff like the Gaussian kernel or other kind of kernels that you don't uh, directly can view in this way. You might not have, have access to a parameterization like this. Okay? So let me just do a kind of a bit uh, uh, more abstract step, and then I try to explain it. What is the idea? Well, just take what we've done now, okay, and then just replace 
with uh, kx with kx and w with f. And this is what you get. You get these two equations, OK? Remember that this gives me f at x. So this is basically find an f which at xi is equal to yi. And here it says find an f that at every point x gives me a good approximation of a fro. OK? This problem, both of them can be imposed, OK? It might be that a fro is not a linear function, or in this case, that it doesn't belong to the kernel I took. I take the polynomial kernel, and my function is, uh, is whatever. It's, it's, discontinu it's not continuous, OK? So all these can be imposed. And plus, I sample, and I put noise. <clears throat> we can stop here. I just wanted to mention a slightly more geometric point of view to interpret these operators that give some insight. This is basically a point of view that was uh, suggested by Kaufman and Lafon a few years ago. If you look at the, suppose now the interesting case to look at this operator is the one where x is the ambient space and m is the support of your input distribution. Okay? And uh, what we are, th and so this is just a 2D case, so my data have two dimensions, but really they lie on a one dimensional surface, which I call m. Okay? And y now is the function values. <coughs> This is exactly the situation we think it happens in practice, okay? It might not be a manifold, it might not be a set, but certainly it's not the full space. It's not a fully supported distribution, okay? Then, in this case, you can view the effect of this operator as a restriction, okay? So the function in H are defined everywhere here. So when I apply this operator, I'm just restricting them to the point that come from this M, okay? If you look at the adjoint of this operator, you can view it as an extension operator. You have a function that you know has values only here, but you're going to define it everywhere else. Okay? And you can prove that this operator, in some sense, is the one that has minimal distortion of the two norms here and here. So in some sense, it's a minimal norm inter uh, uh, extension of the function. If you write this case, if you replace the true set okay, with the data, what you get is an operator, the restriction operator, that you can use as a sampling operator. Given a function, you evaluate it at the points. And it's a joint, it becomes something that is actually pretty useful in practice, which is the out of sample extension. So now C is a vector, and you can view it as function values at points, and now you extend it everywhere because look at this equation, this holds for any x. Okay? So now you have this value function at points. And then you sum them up, and this holds for any x, and this will give you a value of a function at any x. Okay? There is a mistake here. There should be s star c. Okay, so this holds for any x. So I'm extending the function values from the training set points everywhere. Okay? Uh, okay, so this is better, but this is the setup. Once you have this, you can just turn the crank and apply the algorithms. So you get this. If you have a finite parameterization of f, this is what you get. And if you look at the complexity, <coughs> here I write the complexity comprising the fact that we might want to compute this for more than one lambda. And here is the comparison between the three methods. And the, 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 the quick inspection showed that essentially the iterative method is the winner by far between this guy. Okay? It's the one that gives you the best possible computation. Of course, now you can say, well, how did you solve Tikhon if you could have done conjugate grade? Then yes, but I'm doing it here. I only do it once. So to some extent, why would I want to do it more than once for different values of lambdas? Okay? So a key point here is if you know lambda or if you have to look for different kind of lambdas. And in practice, oftentimes, you need to have to search for more than one solution. Now, if this function doesn't have a finite dimensional parameterization, you can play this trick. Essentially, you can you can basically show that the function always have a representation of this form, is a representative form of the representative theorem, and reduce the problem to just computing coefficients over this finite dimensional problem. K here is just a kernel matrix, it's an n by n matrix. Okay? And so now you just have to apply the filter function on the spectrum of the empirical kernel matrix. And to prove it is really just one line of linear algebra, there's some, nothing deep. But in some sense here, you know that you can always like, either work in some sense in the primal, if you can or in some form of dual, where the dimension of the space doesn't matter anymore. And you can ask yourself, what's the complexity? It changes a bit. Instead of nd, essentially, you've got n squared plus the price of computing the kernel matrix. But it's basically what you have. Okay? And again, this algorithm will give you much better complexity than the other two, especially if you have the fact that we, because of these one restart properties, the more steps you take, the more or less you regularize. 
So some of this stuff is known, some of this stuff is not known. Some of this stuff has been rediscovered or discovered in several occasions. Of course, Tikhonov ridge regression is very old. More recently, they've been called least square super vector machine. TSVD can just be seen as a form of principal component, usage of principal component analysis in supervised, and it's called principal component regression. <coughs> For example, uh, Sham has some recent results where he was looking at some finite dimensional case of this. Uh, the iteration has been called L2 boosting and introduced by, in statistics by uh, Bing Yu and Peter Booman a few years ago and has been studied even recently. And the list can keep on going, okay? Conjugate gradient turns out to be equivalent to what is the called partial least squares, and you can have a theory for that. And then you can move on to this kind of acceleration. You can try to think about incremental methods. And here the list, especially if you go and explore uh, different iteration scheme, is very long, okay? And you can ask yourself which one works best in practice, which one you can prove something. So quickly about theory. I'm gonna, I almost want to skip these slides, but just to give you an idea, I'm throwing, I want to study the statistical properties of this method, and I'm throwing away eigenvalues, okay? That's essentially what my algorithm is doing. So if my function, if not many eigenvalues are different from zeros, or my function can be really well written on those eigenvalues, on those eigenfunctions, then the algorithm is gonna work. So I have these two parameters, okay? How many eigenvalues I have different from zero? How many components of my function are different from zero? Okay? And in the standard fixed design setting, this is exactly what comes out. In this more general setting, you have similarly two parameters. They're called source condition or degrees of imposedness or freedom. Okay? And instead of just a number, you can also take a decay. Okay? Instead of saying they, they are n and then 0, you can just say they have a certain profile. And this allows you to get a theory both for the infinite dimension and the finite dimensional case. A long story short, what you have is that if you do take this kind of decay condition for all the methods, you get this result, okay? And if you take the finite, finiteness assumption, so the, if you assume your space to be finite dimensional, this is what you get, okay? So the new thing to, to notice is this, these bounds are essentially optimal up to constant, okay? And the filter function only enters as a constant or as the range of possible smoothness that you can allow in your problem, okay? Tikhonov is blind to smoothness up to a certain order. There is a known effect called saturation, okay? And so you don't improve results after a certain point. So this is a, this is a bit weird. And to some extent, all the algorithms have exactly the same statistical properties up to constant, okay? Now constant might matter, but to a level, they all act in the, exactly in the same way. They have all the same minimax rates. <coughs> you can... Uh, find different ways to do adaptivity, you can find finite dimension. But in some sense, the natural question to me now is, if I, now I give you this class of minimax uh, problems, what is the best computational <coughs> complexity you can get on these kind of problems, okay? And here I show you that my, my benchmark is certainly not Tikhonov, it's these iterative methods whose complexity I wrote before is this, okay? So I would like to know, are, is there other, uh, are there other algorithm achieving minimax rates with complexity better than this, okay? And of course, a key point here is how do you choose lambda? What kind of algorithm you do? If you do hold out, you don't have much overhead. If you have to do an SVD to choose lambda, because for example, you want to do complexity regularization and use some kind of penalty, then this kills this complexity, okay? So how do you choose lambda matters? Uh, just a side remark, you might think that, you know, this is, the theory is for free, is not quite, because uh, this operator have different domain, and so you cannot just compare them, okay? You have to introduce some other notion of noise, which are not the canonical one in inverse problem. And it turns out that this is actually the natural thing you have to do when you have to study discretization problems. So bridging somewhat with fields like PDEs, where in some sense you have a continuous case and you want to discretize it. But it also gives you a way to look at, if you have a discrete problem and you want to do subsampling, you can just plug it in here and you have a result for that kind of situation, okay? Where instead of a continuous distribution, you have a, a discrete distribution, but with a very large support, and now you want to subsample. Okay, so these are exactly the quantity that will appear there too. So a few comments. I guess uh, the main one, as I said, is it, it does give me this way of thinking a bit more computationally to regularization, and that to me is very inspiring. Of other tricks I could use, and now whenever somebody tell me a trick that you use to make his computation faster or more stable, I will feel like sitting down and figure out if I can view it as some kind of regularization and avoid repeating things twice. Okay. And as I said, I think uh, this is exactly kind of the intuition beside behind that. 
the interview regularization and merge kind of the algorithm of choice. So the natural question is, can I do it for other loss functions? Okay, and the answer is yes. Can I do it well? Well, I don't know. We just started. Can you do it for other regularizers? Okay, I think you won as a, as a p recent paper. I know, for example, total variation, you can do it is a standard case. Can you do it for L1? There are some results. We are doing some results for learning. And the other thing is that there is a whole bunch of tricks, as I said. For example, you know, we discussed with Ben Rack that you're using random features. It was his idea. <laughs> I was mostly listening. He was, you do block coordinate descent with random features. It turns out that you can do it this way. Or you can divide your data set. Okay, in blocks and then average out. This is another way of doing a randomized filter. And you can keep on going. You can do some kind of incremental maelstrom and keep on going. And this is in the attempt to break the complexity barrier be below essentially this ND complexity. Okay? Uh, so quickly, uh, how much time I have? Zero? Two minutes? Uh, nine minutes. Nine minutes. Okay. So. Let me then try to show you quickly at least one slide about uh, <coughs> something else. Just one comment. Take what I told you, okay, and for example, just replace the output with the RT. I, I did everything for real values, okay? Do it for RT or for a Hilbert space. This is interesting for multitask or for functional regression. Nothing changed, okay? It's all the same. It's for free. <coughs> and in fact, minor modification of this allows you to actually consider a situation where you do some kind of noisy density estimation, the convolution problem. They've been used recently to study so-called regularized kernel mean embeddings. Uh, Misha has been using this in this problem that he calls uh, inverse density estimations. There is some ideas related to Bayes inference in this perspective and so on and so forth. So this same idea can apply in all the setting and will be in some sense you do start from Tikhonov and I can come in and just tell you just do this other stuff which may be computationally more efficient. Okay? And it, they're equivalent essentially. The other thing you can do is move on and somewhat take this other point of view where, you know, that has been one of the main themes of this workshop, this idea that spectral properties of certain operators yield information about the geometry of sets. And here I just want to, uh, you know, just sketch one example of something we did a while ago. It's a very simple question and it's essentially the problem of estimating the set, the distribution, sorry, the support of the distribution, okay? So I know that my sample comes from some set and I want to estimate the set. And this is related to the problem of so-called novelty detection or problem of surface modeling. And I would like to understand more specifically if the eigenfunction or the spectral structure of the integral operator itself, rather than some other quantity related to it, like a Laplacian or other things related to this operator, can yield information about this set. Okay? I basically want to go from exactly from the original space into the spectral properties of an operator or function of the space. So I, I take an abstract setting, but the, uh, the, the highlights are essentially that this is an unsupervised problem. I have data, I have a distribution, and I have some kernel, okay? And then I'm given some data, and I would like to estimate the support of the distribution. Aside from details, this is my problem, okay? So I have the support, and I sample it, and I would like to get it back according to some norms or metric over sets. So here was the idea. So. I guess some of you are familiar with the, the Mercer theorem, or Carl and expansion, and so on. And it basically says the following. If you consider this integral operator with kernel k over probability measure rho, then you can expand the k in this way. OK? And this is a well-known fact. A detail in this thing is that the proof that dates back 100 years ago asks the support of the distribution to be the whole space, OK, and to be compact which is not a very natural situation in learning because this is a probability distribution. It's measure one. It's not Lebesgue like it was done 100 years ago. And so in fact, you can generalize this theorem by basically asking the support to be whatever it is, let me call it M, and this to be continuous but bounded, okay? The key point is that this expression here doesn't hold for any XX prime. It only holds for the XX prime from the support, okay? If x and x prime come from the support, I have this expression. So the curiosity was, what if I take, and in particular, of course, I can take x prime equal to x, OK? Now, the, the curiosity was, what happens if I take a point which is not in the support? Do I have this equality or not? So if I take an x which is not in the support, does this equality hold or not? What is the catch here? Suppose that it holds if and only if the point in the support. 
Then I could try to compute the quantity like this and use it as a test to, def to, to determine whether a points belong to the support or not. Okay? Of course, if this is not a, a, a characterization of the support, that's not possible. Long story short, it's not true for any kernel. Okay? There are certain kernels that are rich enough that you can actually have this one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, support and uh, Mercer theorem. And Mercer theorem becomes a test. There are other kernels which are not good enough. And essentially, the kernel are kernel such that for a given set, that you can find functions that are zero on the set and non-zero everywhere else. Okay? So essentially, bump functions. They have to be a, a, a space of functions which are not too smooth. So it's, it's easy to convince yourself that certain kernels will be fine for certain kind of sets. But if the set is complicated, certain kernel will not fail. If the set, so if this is x and this is m, if you take the linear kernel, you can find the hyperplane that is exactly zero here. And so that would be enough. But if you take a set of this form, which is just a piece of an hyperplane, then the, a hyperplane will keep on putting zero also here. So this simple linear kernel will not be enough. Okay, which is intuitive. The kernel has to be flexible enough to be able to zero out everything but the support. <clears throat> you can ask yourself if there are kernel in at least in RD that can separate any set. Okay, and the short answer is yes, and they have to be non-smooth enough. And for example, the Gaussian kernel doesn't work. It's analytic as soon as it's zero in one portion of the space. You have to be zero all around it, and so you won't be able to separate the set appropriately. Now, I'm almost done. Essentially, the point here is that if the set is separated by k, or if k separates any set, in which case it will be true, then this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. The point in the support are exactly the one for which this equality holds. Okay? And then you can use it, you can use it as a Merced test. Okay? You take it, you do it. And the key point here is, uh, let me be a bit quick, uh, Essentially, these are the eigenfunctions. You can imagine that, in some sense, you have to decompose the, the. You can try to use the technology I showed you before. The idea here is that computing this quantity when sigma becomes small will be an unstable procedure. So I might want to cut off this expression when you have finite data. And essentially, you can realize that you can rewrite this in terms of integral operator. And roughly speaking, you replace the integral operator with the empirical integral operator. Then you get the kernel matrix, and you keep on going, and you get. Uh, an inverse that you have to stabilize, and blah, 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 blah. And you can apply exactly the kind of techniques I showed you before, filters, and so on. And you get a new family of you want one class algorithm or support estimation algorithm that are iterative and all the properties I showed you before. Okay? Of course, the theory is different. This is not a supervised problem anymore, and now I have to understand what's going on. And I, I'm going to skip basically all this. Uh, uh, you can prove consistency, but no rates, in Hausdorff distance. You get pretty good empirical results. And it was one step in the direction of understanding how the properties, spectral properties, kind of convolution integral operator is information about geometric information about the set itself. Okay? And this is basically what I wanted to say. So the, the, again, to me, the, the key point here are really this idea that uh, beyond penalization, I can try to use other principles. And then I can try to apply them. And in some sense, think whatever computational trick you do, if it yields some way to stabilize your problem. <clears throat> and the other direction, which I'm very curious about now, is push this iterative regularization perspective and see to which extent I can use it as a default mechanism, which will be useful for uh, other learning problems. Okay. And last but not least, this idea, which is just at the beginning of, uh, of studying integral operators and geometry. If you've seen what I've just said, I don't assume any manifold structure or anything. Okay. It's just a set. Okay. So one one question is how much when we push it. All right. Say something about, about like how, how do I estimate and find that data set? Is that part of the problem? I am that. In this last case, you mean? Yeah, in the last case. Well, in the end, basically, like what I do is that I take this equation vis a vis. Yeah. This requires knowledge of the distribution. When you have data, you replace these eigenfunctions with some eigenfunction that you, out of sample extension of eigenfunction you compute on your data set. Okay? And it was a bit quick, but essentially this is what you need to do. So inst instead of using this function, 
you can now use an, a completely empirical function. But what might happen at this point is that you need a tolerance. Okay? So you have to say how much this equality is violated. And you have two parameters, this global parameter and this local parameter. So this becomes my set estimate. Okay? So top decreases as sample size increases. Yes, exactly. And they're not unconditioned. I mean, some said this is the weak part of this theory. It's just, again, it was just a bit at the beginning. We don't have super sharp rates or super sharp geometric understanding of that. So, so it seems like there should be some variant where you uh, deprecate the eigenvalues by an exponential. You yes. Know, something like the heat equation. But yeah. You did that somewhere, or, and I missed it, or? No, I did not. I did not. So the thing I don't know is uh, it makes perfect sense. The one thing I don't know is. Uh, uh, can you sh can we show that that, that, that has a good uh, computational implementation? Okay. That's a nice question. And uh, so, in some sense, the, the easy part is: uh, can you just put it? And I would say yes. We can just probably put it in and just show it as properties. The question is: can we avoid doing the SVD to compute it? And that is actually I don't know. And I think is the is the hard part of the story. Yeah, but you think you'd use something like the stuff that Lorenzo yeah. break your work done and yeah. matrix exponentials, right? Then. Yeah, I, I think uh, it, make, it makes sense. I, I've not done it, and I don't think anybody has done it. In some sense, this exactly. Once you know this, you know, bring in all your tricks and try to see if you can. Play. I just give you my best and a way to think about it. And just speak. Thank you.